one of my favorite stories too, but it's one of my favorite stories partially because it's a biblical story of what happened when Jesus was confronted with a need. What did he do? It's also my favorite story because it's about food. <laughs> Just have to admit that up front. The place where this feeding took place, you heard it described in scripture this morning, was a pretty rough looking place according to the scripture. It was barren, uh, it was a big open space, there was nothing there, there was no stores, there was no place to buy anything or get anything. It was a pretty rough place. So the disciples, they had an idea of what to do when people, when they met hungry people, they simply said, send them home, send them away. We're not going to take care of them. And I wonder how often that has been true of the church when someone has come to the church with a physical or a spiritual or an emotional need and the church just kind of said, why don't you just go away? There's another church up the street or we call United Ministries or somebody, but we send them away. And I wonder how many people are still being turned away and they're getting the message from the church that they just need to move on and fend for themselves. I have a quick story about, about needs. I, I know that sometimes I have prayed a prayer asking for God to show me a need. And I have to be careful when I pray that prayer because every time I do and I pay attention, there are all kinds of things that I begin to see. Well, I prayed that prayer one day as we were leaving for a retreat. And I prayed it out loud to about 40 people or so. And some of them were texting and some were looking at movies on their cell phones, but some were listening evidently. Because as we drove on down the interstate and I made a turn off of the interstate onto the exit ramp, as I started down the exit ramp, there he was, the guy with the sign. And you have all seen a guy with a sign. And I couldn't read it, I was too far away, but I had a pretty good idea of what the sign said. I wasn't close enough to know everything, but I knew something, so I also looked in the mirror and everybody was looking at me and kind of leaning over to see what the sign said. So I reached in my pocket and I tried my best not to get a 20 because I didn't want to get a 20. And uh, I also didn't want the light to turn red. I wanted it to stay green so I could just go right on through and keep going. It turned yellow and then it turned red. And I put the brakes on and as I stopped, I was standing, my bus was sitting exactly next to that sign that was staring right in my window with everybody behind me looking at me to see what I was going to do. Well, I rolled the window down and the sign did say, we'll work, and you finish it out, we'll work for food. But under that was another line that I hadn't seen before. And it said, I can't lie, I need a beer. <laughs> I already had my money part of the way out the window and everyone was watching. So what was I supposed to do? I wonder what you would do. It's very clear in the story what Jesus did. He asked what was available. The disciples knew that it wasn't nearly enough. Such a very small amount, yet it was all that Jesus would need to feed the people. Five loaves, two fish, so the question is, how could such a small amount take care of such a huge need? I think sometimes we forget what little we have and how that little can be used by God on such a grand scale. We tend to forget that our littleness, when it's given into the hands of a grand God, equals miracles. Now, think about the plan that Jesus must have had in mind when he began to do what was impossible. The group began to sit down in groups of 50 and 100, 
And Jesus began his miracle with everybody's eyes on him, kind of like the people on the bus looking at me. He offered the food. He said a prayer, said a blessing. And then he began to pass out the five loaves of bread. And he passed them out to the groups and they began to eat. Likewise with the fish. And I wonder what the people thought as they watched him again hold the fish, say a prayer, bless it, break it. And then as he kept giving it out of his hands into the baskets for the disciples to distribute. And pretty soon everybody had all that they needed to eat and there were baskets full left over. Beautiful story and a beautiful miracle. I want to tell you about another more recent miracle. It's similar. It happened a few years ago. Some of you have heard this story and some of you in this room were there. I found myself in Farmville, Virginia, standing at the parsonage of the Beulah AME Church. The parsonage was built in 1870. It's the oldest owned African-American owned property in Prince Edward County. And you know Prince Edward County is the place where they closed public schools for five years just to keep African-American children from going to public school. Well, this AME Church and the parsonage is where the African-American children went to school during those five years. We were going to try to fix or kind of patch up the parsonage so that at a later time, somebody could come in and renovate it and fix it like it needed to be. That was our only goal at that point. We were going to stop the decay so that it could be fixed later. Well, there were 120 folks coming up to work on this building. And I was there with my friend Ben Vogler and the contractor who knew what to do because neither one of us did. And so he looked at the building and he said, hmm. And he looked at something else and he touched something else and it went on and on and on and on and every time he would say, hmm. And then he looked at us and didn't say that. He said, I can't do it. I don't know how. Well, what were two youth ministers going to do? How were we going to fix that building? We didn't know what to do. But he said, I know someone that can. I know someone that knows what he's doing. But he and I had a little uh, bout with each other, and we are not getting along too good. And I hadn't talked to him in about three or four months. And I said to him, call him, tell him you're sorry, and that you need him, which he did. And he said he would check and see. But the contractor also said, before people can come here and work, I need six skilled carpenters to work with me Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday before the group started work on Monday. I also need this forklift. I, I don't know what else to call it, but it was huge. But he needed it because the building had settled in the middle. It was a two-story building, and it had settled eight inches, and they needed to pick it up. The roof was not attached to the sides of the house. It had to be reattached. It needed a new roof, and it needed all kinds of work. So we didn't have any of that. We, did, we called, and we couldn't get any help. We couldn't get the forklift. Uh, we couldn't even get the building material that we needed. We were kind of like out in the desert. There was nothing there that we needed. And a member of the choir from the AME church came in for choir practice. And she stopped and talked to Ben and said, how are things going? And Ben said, not very well. We are in pretty bad shape. And she said, our choir will pray for you. And we will pray that you will have everything that you need and more. Well, the people that were there with me know that within about 10 minutes, we got a phone call from Junior who said, I can come and I know how to fix the building. 
we met a contractor at Longwood University that was redoing the dorms that had six carpenters that he didn't need until Monday. And he said we would be doing him a favor if we were to hire those carpenters for a few days. We asked about a forklift. We couldn't find one to rent. He delivered one the next day free of charge. The building materials that couldn't come until Friday or Saturday got loaded by mistake at the end of the truck, which meant they had to be unloaded on Thursday morning, first thing. We had problems getting dumpsters, and then pretty soon we had all of the dumpsters that we needed. We raised the building, we leveled the floors, we never used that big forklift thing, but we did make pictures with it because they looked pretty cool. <laughs> to shorten the story, the building that we were going to stabilize now has level floors, it has a new roof, it has new walls, new plumbing, new wiring, new bathroom, new kitchen, new doors and windows and siding. Now that 1870s house is the first house you see when you enter, enter the historic district in Farmville. Just as Miss Hayes prayed, we had all that we needed and more. In the biblical story, Mark tells us in the last few verses that Christ was in charge and provided what was needed and more to the multitude that was there. The people received a blessing of his miracle. They were indeed blessed and fed. Just as today, God still blesses and feeds his church. The church is the place where God provides everything that we need and so much more. It's a place that's filled with love from non-judgmental friends and leaders. It's a safe place where we can be ourselves. C.S. Lewis wrote, God works on us in all sorts of ways, but above all, he works on us through each other. What Lewis knew is that true growth for a Christian is not attained without other people. And one final example of a modern day miracle is what happened when this community of faith established what was called the Faith Fund, which is now First Baptist Church Foundation. And as it exists today, its purpose is to provide funds to sustain and increase the missions ministry of First Baptist Church. It is doing that through the funds it provides each year so that when there's a need, there are resources there to meet that need. You want to make a difference? Then remember the five loaves and the two fish. You want to make a difference? Remember Beulah AME Church in Farmville, Virginia. You want to make a difference? Remember the foundation of First Baptist Church, Greenville. It may seem a small thing to you, but when given into the hands of God, your willingness can begin to change the world. One of the ministries that receives funds from the foundation is Annie's House, which is on Baxter Street, which is just across the reedy from our ball fields. It is at Annie's House that I met our real speaker today. She is Kristen Pitts. She is one of my most favorite people in all the world. And I'm delighted that she's here to speak to us today. Thank you, Kristen. Good morning, Frank. Thank you for such a sweet introduction. Um, with it being Foundation Sunday, let me begin first by saying thank you for the generosity of the First Baptist Foundation. Whether your gift was $1 or $1 million or anywhere in between, your generosity has helped support good work in the world, and most importantly, in our local community. I have had the privilege of serving with two organizations that have been beneficiaries of the foundation, Mere Christianity Forum and Annie's House by Sustaining Way. My time with both organizations has both informed and transformed me in so many ways. So thank you. On Thursday, when Black History Month began, 
I was reminded that this year is the 50th anniversary of the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Since his I Have a Dream speech, we have made progress, but we still have a long way until the dream he envisioned comes to pass in its entirety. In the speech, Dr. King said, there are those who will ask, when will you be satisfied? And to answer that question, he goes on to say that we won't be satisfied as long as there are issues of injustice, issues of economic immobility, voter suppression, environmental racism, and the like. Dr. King gave the dream speech in 1963. 55 years later, the issues he was trying to address are the issues that folks are still advocating for today. So you see, we have made some progress, but we still have a long way to go. As Mary Carroll mentioned, for Black History Month, our theme is Black History, Black Futures. This month, we will wrestle with the question, how do we imagine and live into a better working present and future? After reflecting on this question, the first thing that came to mind is community. In the story presented in the Gospel reading today, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, the miracle often gets most of our attention, but the theme of community is just as clear. In order to live into a better working present and future, we must better embody community. Community can be a vague idea, and having clarity around the idea of community can help us better live into it with one another in more impactful ways. Community is a group of people having a particular characteristic in common. So for many of us, we are part of the First Baptist Greenville's community of faith and a part of the Greenville community as we are residents here, or the Greenville nonprofit community because we work in that field, you get the idea. We can be a part of one or multiple communities, and there are communities within communities. Community is both a feeling and a set of relationships among people. Members of a community have a sense of trust, belonging, safety, and care for each other. But with communities being made up by people, we know that where there are people, there's room for human error. So a fundamental tenet that needs to be present in any community is forgiveness. Because we are bound to hurt one another. So to exist and thrive in community, we must be willing to receive and extend forgiveness on a regular basis. When I started my role at Annie's house, I was invited to, when I was invited to attend First Baptist for the first time, I was quite nervous. I wasn't sure what to expect other than I knew it would be different from what I was used to, having grown up in charismatic, black, and multicultural churches. So reading from a hymnal and not clapping during worship songs or after worship songs was quite foreign. And to be honest, it took some time getting used to. Um, but all differences aside, I began to build rich relationships here, and I now call this place my home. As I became a part of this community, I was eager to plug in in any way that I could. Working in the fellowship hall on Wednesday nights, serving as a greeter one Sunday a month, and serving on the nursery staff. With all of that, I felt connected here. I had met many of you and I felt affirmed. I felt like a member of this community. On one particular afternoon, I came to church to meet a minister. I had a fob that provided me access to the doors, but forgot it in the car, so I rang the bell. Over the intercom, while looking through the glass door, a person said, we don't provide direct services. You can grab one of the sheets out of the box and call 211, and they can connect you to the help that you need. Although we didn't know each other very well, the, the person speaking to me through the intercom had interacted with me more than several times, and we had exchanges that went well beyond hellos and goodbyes. So I buzzed back to let the person know the name of the minister I was here to meet with and reminded them that I worked at Annie's house. 
Eventually, I was buzzed in. This situation was hurtful because it made me feel like I was not a part of this community. Even if they had forgotten our interactions, why would they assume that I was here to ask for assistance? And even if I was in need, is this the best way of extending hospitality to guests? How is this treating someone with dignity? This is just one instance. There are numerous stories that I could share, some from First Baptist, some from the Greenville community, and some from even the Greenville nonprofit community and beyond. I'm not sharing this with you to make you feel guilty. I'm sharing this story with you to show how easy it is to be hurtful without meaning to, to show you that being community isn't something that we just fall into, but something we have to be intentional about. I know that I don't always get it right either, and there are many times I have forgotten to extend hospitality in many other contexts. In these moments, I remember how essential forgiveness is in building community. Forgiveness brings healing to both the wrong and the wronged. Often, we find the perpetrator isn't even aware of the offense. This creates opportunities for reconciliation and teachable moments that can lead to meaningful relationships with one another, more reminiscent of the relationships Jesus requires of us, instead of the surface level and transactional interactions that we are often guilty of. With forgiveness as a key essential, in order to imagine and live into a better working present and future, we must better embody community. In my work with Mere Christianity Forum, we use covenants of presence to better show up in community together and to extend community to others through radical hospitality. I would like to share four of these covenants with you. And they read, one, give and receive welcome, for people learn best in hospitable spaces. In community, we best support each other's learning by giving and receiving hospitality. Two, remember we are all created in the image of God and we come as equals. We don't have the same gifts, limits, or experiences, but no one person's gifts, limits, or experiences are more or less important than, the, than another's. Three, welcome discomfort and location and dislocation, excuse me, in the midst of new and uncomfortable places in the company of strangers, move against an instinct to construct a mental space of safety or check out, seeing what, see what causes unease another world to be discovered. Four, when the going gets rough, turn to wonder. Turn from reactions and judgment to wonder and compassionate inquiry. Ask yourself, I wonder why they feel or think this way, or I wonder what my reaction teaches me about myself. Set aside judgment to listen to others and to yourself more deeply. And as I close today, I invite you to use these covenants as a tool to help each of us better embody community in the spaces that we're in. Peace be with you.